An Introduction to Freud's Theory of Personality Freud's Model of Personality, Part 5 of 7 Personality Psychology, Dr. Michael Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno As an undergraduate student in psychology, I became extremely fascinated with the idea of the id ego and superego. It just was extremely intellectually interesting how you could take a physical brain and place these psychic structures in there and have them provide systematic means of causing behavior. Just was fascinating. This was still in my early days of undergraduate education when I thought I was going to be a clinician and was really excited about Freud's work. I still find the notion of the id ego and superego very interesting, although I've kind of dropped my clinical aspirations uh, long ago, probably, which is one of the best things that ever happened to clinical psychology. Got to pop the eye back. So, I hope you find this model of behavior as fascinating as I do. In Freud's model of personality, there are three levels of consciousness. This is intro psych stuff, so I'll skip through it rather quickly. We have the conscious mind, the pre-conscious, and finally the unconscious. Let me talk about each one of those in turn. First of all, the conscious mind contains thoughts, emotions, perceptions that we're currently aware of. What you're thinking about right now is in your conscious mind. The next level of consciousness is the pre-conscious. Now, the pre-conscious consists of information that we're not presently thinking about, but could be easily retrieved and made conscious. So, hopefully you're more interested in this information than your phone number, but if I were to ask you to recall your phone number, you could most likely pull it from the pre-conscious into the conscious mind. Although with cell phone address books nowadays, there's quite a few numbers I no longer know. But that's a whole different issue. Finally, we have unconscious. The unconscious is the vast store yard of information in our psyche. It has all of our emotions and perceptions and things that we can no longer access or think we have forgotten. It plays a large role in the Freudian model of behavior, but it is also the biggest and largest, well, that's a redundancy, system in the psyche. If you want to explore the unconscious, you might want to follow this exercise a bit. Freud's tripartite model of personality. Within the levels of consciousness reside three centers of psychic energy, and it's very easy to anthropomorphize them and think of them, not as easy as it is, there they start coming. My animation was messed up, sorry. Uh, it's easy to think of these three centers of psychic energy as little guys running around in your head making you do a variety of different tasks. That would be an extremely poor way of looking at them. Rather, there are three sites of psychic energy that in a perfectly har harmonious psyche work in unison to produce behavior and is very mentally healthy. It's only when the three units do not work well together, uh, fracture in some case, are in conflict with each other, where you potentially get mental illness. Now, let me give you one caveat. I just told you not to anthropomorphize the things. 
But as I go through my discussion in this part of the Freud video, I will do that very same thing. Why? It's just so much easier to do that than trying to use a whole bunch of uh, complicated, convoluted verbiage. So please remember that you're not supposed to do that. And then I'm doing it just to make our lives a little simpler. simpler. So let's talk about the first center of psychic energy. And that is the id, or as I like to say with my little tiny bit of German, which is a very tiny bit, das Eat. Notice the id resides totally in the unconscious mind. That's a very important idea there. The id never ever sees consciousness. Now, these centers of psychic energy are also related to psychological development. And we're going to discuss psychological development later in this unit. But I'm sure that you're acquainted with these stages of development from other classes. So talk about the id here. Babies are born all id. All they want to do is get their needs taken care of and their needs satisfied. It doesn't matter how that gets done. The id is the initial reservoir of all psychic energy in the psyche. Babies, essentially, all it. And it contains most of the extremely primitive urges, drives, and things like that in the psyche. The id's instincts can uh, be satisfied in reality or fantasies. I missed the word there. Instinct and drives can be satisfied by reality or fantasy. The it doesn't care. If you have an unmet need, an unmet instinct, and you have a dream about it and that satisfies you, good enough for the it. The it operates according to something called the pleasure principle, which is the need for immediate gratification. The id wants what it wants, and it wants it now. Here's a prime example of id-driven behavior. Here is my second granddaughter, Ava, and it's her birthday. My wife, Vicki, made these lovely cupcakes, and it's really hard telling a young child that they can't have the really cool cupcake, they have to eat dinner first. So you can see that she's a little bit agitated that she can't have exactly what she wants. Here is another example of this. This is my third granddaughter, Blair. And uh, she's getting a little bit more of a satisfactory thing going there. This is the good old first birthday cake that children get to destroy at their parties. It was a hot summer day, and uh, my stepdaughter took her fancy party, well, put, took her fancy party dress off, Blair's dress, that is, so it wouldn't get totally messed up while she was eating. And you can see she's having a great time. So the id, totally in unconsciousness, totally driven by the pleasure principle. But we can't go through life just immediately getting gratifications for things. So Freud speculated on a second psychic structure that would have a way of dealing with reality. And that's the ego. So here's the ego. Notice the ego resides in all three levels of consciousness, unlike the id. And the ego develops 
out of the necessity to deal with the realities of life. It starts out with no psychic energy of its own. What happens is the id gives some energy through the process of identification to the ego to get its needs taken care of. Eventually what happens is through the process of identification, the id gives more and more psychic energy to the ego till it gets to the point where the ego is strong enough actually to suppress the id and control the id and constrain it to reality. This develops within the first couple of years of life. Now the id operates, as we've already said, under the pleasure principle. The ego operates, on the other hand, through the reality principle. And the ego has a understanding that the id is often in conflict with social and physical reality. So the id constrain, is constrained, excuse me, by the ego's energy to keep it from doing things that, well, might hurt you. Finally, oh, let's go back to superego, sorry, I want to say, or ego, I want to say a couple of things about that before we move to superego. So, uh, let me tell you a story about my stepson, who's now in his early 40s. Uh, when James was small, and after my ex's first divorce, she moved back with her parents. So, there were basically four adults, uh, my ex's parents, her and her brother, kind of falling over this one little guy's uh, needs constantly. Uh, James would look at the counter and somebody would say, do you want a cookie? And so all he had to do was look at something and he'd get it. He was pretty much id-driven as a little guy. Well, sooner or later, reality comes in and it's no longer acceptable for the kid to grunt and squeal and whine and point to the cookies. And the ego kind of intermediates with the id and says, I know you want a cookie. I know where the cookies are. Let me help you get one. And by facilitating the needs of the id, the ego gets more and more and more increasing power. Now, very late in Freud's theorizing, like the 1920s, he added a third structure to his psychic model. And that was the superego. Now, the notion for the superego came to Freud after the horrors of World War I. And many scientists and philosophers and scholars wanted to try to figure out how all the atrocities of World War I could happen. They had no idea there'd be a World War II. So the superego was developed. Now, the superego, notice, resides across all three levels of consciousness. In turn, the superego develops externally. It's the only one of the three psychic structures that develops from an outside source. Superego develops from parental discipline or whoever the main primary caregiver for the child is. And again, the superego basically identifies and uncathects or pulls psychic energy from the ego this time to get things done. 
basically superego is the internalization of the ideals, values, and morals of a society. It basically gives us a rubric for following societal rules. So at a certain point of development, which generally coincides with the anal stage, now all of a sudden the kid has to follow some rules. So it's no longer acceptable for a child to point and grunt at the cookie jar and expect an adult to fall all over themselves getting a cookie for the child. Now the child has to learn some of our societal rituals like manners. So now the child has to learn to say, please cookie, or please may I have a cookie, instead of just grunting. And usually what happens is because the child's following the rules, they get what they want, so they learn it following the rules. This is a reasonably good thing to do because it ends up with a satisfying state of affairs. The superego also forms what some people call our conscience, our system of right and wrong. So we learn to follow rules. Now, if you have extremely laissez-faire parents, not a whole lot of rules, uh, you're going to have a poorly developed superego. If your parents are extremely rigid, have lots and lots of rules, and harshly enforce them, you'll probably develop an extremely strong and sophisticated superego. And you'll not want to break the rules of right and wrong under any condition. The main tool a superego has in enforcing societal rules is the emotion of guilt. You break the rules, you should feel guilty for it and beat yourself up for that. But if you have a poor sense of the rules and a poorly developed superego, you're just not going to bother doing that. Now, the superego and the id, unlike ego, are not bound by reality. And you see this all the time. You see individuals that become very rule-bound, even though the rule system might have changed. Something else went off. Uh, if you've ever seen The Big Bang Theory show, one of my favorite comedies, and I know we shouldn't use TV shows for science, but this example fits well. Sheldon Cooper, one of the lead characters, extremely rule bound feels a lot of anxiety if he doesn't follow the rules as he perceives them which includes everything from what to eat on certain days of the week what activities to do down to a roommate agreement and a bathroom agreement as well so, superego is a very interesting structure. It gives us right and wrong. It helps us live in a society. So that was a brief exploration of the three levels of consciousness and the three centers of psychic energy that reside there, the id, ego, and superego. In a harmonious, well-functioning psyche, all of these things work together in harmony. I'll use the analogy of plumbing to talk about the psyche from a Freudian perspective. If everything is flowing correctly through the plumbing system, the right water, hot, cold, goes to the right place, the wastewater goes out, and we don't have to worry about it. When these things aren't functioning right, you may get a essentially 
clogged pipe that the psychic energy gets stuck in, which may cause mental illness. And you need a therapist to help solve that problem with what I would call psychic draino. So look at these three things uh, within the model of consciousness. They're kind of interesting to talk about. See you next time in Personality Psych. This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael Botwin, all rights reserved.